to you. Bye. Brain jerk. Fuck yeah. And we are here. Welcome to back to Squared Circle Shenanigans after forever. Sorry, Brother Paul has been a little under the weather and uh, dealing with stuff. But uh, we're back. Welcome. I am Brother Paul. This is Reese. How's it been, Reese? Doing well. How about you, Brother Paul? We're getting there. We're getting there. Getting back in the swing of things. You know, got a busy week, but I'm ready. Uh, but none other than, or sorry, welcome our guest, none other than the Queen of the Kingdom, Miss Davison Sarai Artemis. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's great to have you. Welcome on. Um, before we get into anything, I'd like to uh, shout out our sponsors. But after that, please tell us more about you, how you got into wrestling, um, some of your background for your training and stuff, and uh, whatever you like to go from, from there in the beginning. Uh, but before that, <clears throat> we want to send a huge shout out to our sponsors for each and every single episode, which is Neiman Cannabis, Smoker Society, Cilantro, 8 Mile Vodka, Amaya's Fresh Mexican Grill, Lane's Pizzeria, Dudes Talking Wrestling, Insane Wrestling Revolution, Pro Wrestling Edge, The Little Brown Jug, Nerdy Designs, and Cur Craving Sports Cards and Collectors. Thank you all for your love and support in each and every episode. And with that being said, let us get into you and your wrestling career. Before we do that, that's a lot of sponsors. You pay me. It for really this is. Story. Yeah, we've got a mouthful. A mouthful. They're they're uh, incredible. We love them all. Mm -hmm. Very lucrative. I didn't realize this was such a high caliber show. Sheesh. Oh, we, we try. Our, we try our hardest yeah. here. We really do. Yeah. So, what do you want to know? How I got into training? Uh, uh, how you got into wrestling in general? Um, and then like, where did you go for training? How did you get into that? Um, you know, okay. did you make any uh interesting friends on the way? You might say that. Um, well, yeah. So in 2019, um, I was actually doing a wrestling podcast as well. And um, it was in Kalamazoo. And my friend Mark is uh, like a, a manager or something at the local radio station. Okay. So we're actually doing it from the radio station, getting a little bit of like push from that. Oh, nice. And a local wrestler named Josh Raymond, um, who's pretty well known in these parts, Josh Abercrombie, historically. Um, and he's a West Michigan wrestler for going on two decades. He came on the show to plug an event for um, IPW, Independence Pro Wrestling. And we just got along really well. So he came back on the show again and then asked Mark and I if we wanted to do a color commentary for IPW. Nice. So we, yeah, we started doing that at the end of 2019. And as soon as 2020 started, I think we did January and February. And then the shutdown hit. So we did that March show and that was it. Um, and then about four months later, I was bored and the shows were all shut down and I was like, I'm this close to wrestling anyway. And so I just asked Josh if I could start training just to work out, like not even really to wrestle, but just to do it. Right. Um, and I just kind of picked it up really fast. Okay. And so it became a question of like, I'm old, by the way, I was 44 when I started training, I'm 48 now. Oh, wow. And so I was like, is this even feasibly right. possible? He's like. Yeah, you don't look your age and you're kind of good. So we went for it. Um, and then I debuted in October of 21. And then I wrestled for almost exactly two years um, until I decided to wrap it up uh, this last October. I had my last match with Stella Bujos in Chicago, <laughs> Illinois. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I got here. Started training um, August of 20. And I was done by October of 21. So about 14 months. Nice. Pretty thorough. Yep. And uh, where did you go for training? Um, it was with Josh Raymond here in California. Okay, nice. Yeah. And yeah, uh, you just trained with him. He yeah. So was it like a uh, individual training per se? Oh no, no. He had a class going when I showed up. Oh, okay. So um, it's pretty standard. Like you've got House of Truth on the east side of the state where they'll do like ten week loops with like classes. Mm -hmm. Over here, he did it more kind of old school, where it was like you'll debut when I think you're ready to debut. Maybe it'll be ten weeks. Maybe it'll be three years we're just gonna make sure you get there right um my first day of training was in a barn for like the uh -huh. first six months it was in a barn out in bangor jesus wow. the, my first day i uh this i'm not joking everybody has their horror stories but my first day it was like 100 degrees out and like 95 percent humidity Ooh, i had wow. not exercised seriously in like two years i had not eaten enough i had not drank enough water and i get motion sick Ooh. so <laughs> I vomit all over the place for motion sickness. 
getting more dehydrated. I start vomiting from dehydration and heat exhaustion. I pass out on the ground under a tree outside. I start shivering as if it was cold. It's 100 degrees, uh, which meant I had like heat stroke symptoms. Right. Um, came home, vomited a bunch, and then I went back two days later and it was great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that, first, that first day I was a living hell. Yeah, it's pretty rough. You look, you know what? It's all right. We'll come back eventually. I mean, what are you going to do? I don't want to. Later. I feel better. Let's try again. Kind of. He was like, Are you. Do you have some water? Did you bring some fruit? Do you. <laughs> you all right? All the stuff. Yeah. Check your pulse. Make sure you're going to make it through this. Right. Um, but while I was there, there were people who had already been training for like two years and are already starting to get some early matches. Um, and then after I was there for about five or six months, some new people were starting behind me. So I was almost kind of like a class of my own in a way um, behind that group and ahead of this group. And so I get to help train some people as I came up, which is also really fun. Nice. Interesting. Yeah. And um, did you always know you want besides, did you grow up watching wrestling? I've been obsessed with wrestling since I was young. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, so with that, did you always have like an interest in working in the industry? I did. Um, even in college, actually, I went up to the UP for a couple of weeks. Do you remember a wrestler way back in the day called um, Bastion Booger? Yes. Big fat dude. Mm -hmm. um, his name was Mike Shaw. He lived in the UP. Um, and a college friend of mine and I went up there for like three weeks. This would have been like 1998, 1999. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I, we haven't talked about this yet, but I'm a trans person. And I transitioned about 10 years ago. So okay. this would have been like when I was still in guy world. Um, we went up and trained for like two weeks and that was in a Thai boxing gym. So the ring wasn't even a wrestling ring. That was really brutal. Um, and I decided, you know what, I'm too skinny and I'm in college and I don't like that sucks. I don't want to do that. Um, but then later I transitioned and I'm with Josh and it was a whole different, you know, ball of wax. Um, so long story short, yes, I always dreamed of wrestling. The UP talked me out of it. Josh talked me back into it. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And uh, did you have a wrestler or multiple wrestlers that you grew up admiring? I did. I really like technical wrestling a lot. Okay. Um, so I really liked Bret Hart when I was coming up. Um, it's really controversial because of his situation, but Chris Benoit, mm -hmm. um, not a fan at this point in time, but I mean, as far as a technical wrestler who's believable, you know, hard hitting. Wanna... Wrestler, one of the top five um, human being or what happened, that's a different story. But exactly. Just technical yeah. wrestler yeah. in general, I'd say top a, five. Yeah. If you Anything take Anything else, the, it's a different story. Yeah. So you would say you like Chris Benoit the wrestler instead of like Chris Benoit the man, as no, you would say. Chris Benoit the man. Yeah. Those are two separate yeah. lives. Yeah. No, of course, I work in mental health as well. I'm a, I'm a therapist. I've been for 14 years. So I also think about the CTE factor they talk right. about with his brain damage. I mean, right. I, regardless, uh, technical. So, you know, Dynamite Kid, Bret Hart for sure, Benoit, Ric Flair to some extent. But then later when I started getting into like Ring of Honor, it was Daniel Bryan, it was Nigel McGuinness, it was, okay. you know, Kurt Angle, like later on he popped in. Right. Um, and when I trained with Josh, that was a lot of what I focused on. He likes technical wrestling too. And he was really happy to teach me because I'm stoked on it. And he was like, you're never going to use this in any matches. I promise you. And I'm like, ah, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> you know what? He's like, right. <laughs> he's like, other people need to train in this shit too. And they don't. <laughs> I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so like uh, Zach Sabre Jr. If you see his recent match against Daniel Bryan. Yeah. Oh Incredible. Um, yeah, it was. And, and heels. I love heel wrestlers my whole life too. So yeah. Randy Savage and um, Adrian Adonis when I was younger. Um, Four Horsemen, you know, to some extent, like, Mm -hmm. And so you like to portray as a heel in wrestling. I do. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, if your favorite, <laughs> if your favorite wrestlers, wrestlers are heels, are heels. you're most likely going to be a heel. Yes. And we've well, had, just gonna, yeah, it, it just kind of comes. It just kind of comes natural. Like if you're. That's fair. I, we didn't talk about swearing on the show. Are you allowed to swear on here? Yep. You're yeah. Good. Yeah. I mean, I've just been like I've been a shit talker since I was a little kid. Right. So. You know, and I was I played bands forever. Like I skateboarded when I was younger. Like it's always just been shit talk, shit talk, shit talk. So being able to do it as a wrestler was really fun. Um, getting applauded for being like as mean <laughs> as possible. Like wow, okay, I think I could do that. Um, 
And it's been fun taking the therapist gimmick and turning that into this like evil, diabolical kind of genius type. Nice. Yeah, it's really fun. And uh, so you would say, uh, and we've had previous wrestlers say it, it's a lot more fun being a heel. You get to have a little bit more freeway and you get to say what you sort of what you want. <laughs> Well, yeah, to some extent. To yeah. some extent, obviously, you know, you can't say everything, but heels get more leeway and yeah. better options for promos than mm -hmm. faces. Yeah, we do. But and that here's the issue though too is, and you've heard this language. Um, everybody wants to be a cool heel, so like, yeah, you get more freedom, you can say stuff, but that's yeah. also a good way to get yourself over. And some heels do; they want to like get themselves over. Yeah. So you have to be careful to use that freedom and like get yourself over enough that you can then put that person over yourself yeah. to elevate the baby face. But uh, I've seen too many people like have fun on the mic and they never turn it back into heel mode. It's like, oh, cool. You just, you just introduce some of the baby face in the match. That's going right. to you know, mess with the dynamics. But uh, there's some responsibility on you as a heel. You have to kind of lead the match for the most part. You pace it for the most part. Um, being baby's fun though, because the crowd actually gets behind you and they like get your your comeback. Like, there's right. it's fun in both directions, but heel work is definitely where it's at. We have some uh, heels here at IWR, and people still back them. You know? yeah. hey, um, I, I, I as a kid, I liked you know the per se good guys, baby faces, or good girls, baby faces. But today, mm -hmm. I like more of the heels. Yeah, you know my all time favorite baby faces though was um, before Bailey came up to the main shows when she was on NXT. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've ever seen a better natural baby face than Bailey. I I was really upset when they cut her hair and made her darker. I was like, Vince, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To Vince. But like her match, her match against uh, Sasha Banks at the time when they had that main event at uh, NXT Takeover Brooklyn. Yep. Yeah. Ooh, that's my all-time favorite women's match. That that was great. I loved it. Hundred percent. Sorry, I'm on a tangent. No, okay. you're fine. Um. Speaking of like with uh, heels and that, uh, so you've trash talk a, a crowd, correct? A couple times. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> so with this, uh, when you trash talk a crowd or per se shoot a promo inside or outside of the ring, uh, has there some been something you've said that you've like immediately regretted? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> would you Would you mind sharing if you can? No, it's fine. It's actually really funny. Um, so I've only wrestled as babyface maybe twice ever because it was always heel. Um, but when I debuted over in Chicago at All Star Lucha Libre, which is a place I still try to push pretty heavily because the people who run it do just really awesome people. Um, it was me against two guys, and so it was going to be babyface girl against two big heel guys. Oh. And um, I, I did a spot where I got one of the guys in the corner. I jumped up to give him ten punches, but it was at the Berwyn Eagles Lodge, which is right smack in Berwyn, which is like Mexican town, like just outside of Chicago. And so like. Without thinking about it, I, I jumped up as the baby face and I went, I don't speak Spanish, count in English. <laughs> I started punching and they counted in English. And then afterwards, my friend was like, what the fuck was that? And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, you told them they can't speak English. That's total heel stuff. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> I might be, but I'm also just being honest with them. <laughs> I'm like, you know, Stoya, yeah, I can't even speak Spanish. So right. <laughs> they forgave me. Um, it's all Espanol. <laughs> Now, there was a time when I was down in Indiana, and this wasn't a talking thing. I actually got banned from a, a company in Muncie, Indiana, called Indiana Powerhouse Wrestling, because it was after the match, and I'd been beaten up in a cage match, and I was, like, staggering around, like, selling my, my beat up. And there are all these little kids kind of, like, running next to me and, like, on the other side of the, the barrier. So I'm, like, walking and kind of stumbling. And, Reese, I don't know if you ever saw me in person. Sometimes I'll just, like, spit. Just yeah, I've seen it, yeah like kind of gross. So I did that where I was like tired and just like, like spit. There was a little kid right here. Oh no. Oh my God. Didn't see him. Uh -oh. So I just, I just turned and went. Oh. oh no. Oh no. And the kid's mom was right there. And I just like walked to the back Wait, no, and no, 10 no. minutes later I'm out selling merch and I see this angry woman with the little kid and she's like pointing at me yelling about something. Uh oh. And I just assume she's like, doing the wrestling heel thing. So right. I'm like, ah, rah, 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 rah. well, it turns out she went and told the owners and the owners hit me up in a couple of days. I was like, give me your side of the story. I'm like, I don't know what story you're referring to. The part about you spitting on that little kid. And I'm like, what? Where's the little kid? Where? Exactly. And so I didn't, I didn't see him. 
it turned into a thing. And I wrote a whole long apology to send to the mom. And I said, I would send money down to buy the kid. Mer-. Like, I don't want it. That's not me. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but everybody saw me do it. So it was me. So I was like, Ooh. So, wow. Yeah. Yikes. That's the first, that's the first time right. I've ever heard something like, <laughs> you know, and just randomly had to spit, the you know, it, was, it just had to happen to be there. I mean, was uh, it your uh, first time there or did you? Oh no, it was like my, my, my third time there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep, <laughs> my first way. time there. That's probably why they see it as disrespect. I mean, they know I'm a smart ass and I'm always a dirty heel. So like, I don't know. There was another funny one over in uh, Illinois. I wrestled at a place called um, Rocket Pro Wrestling, which is mm-hmm. pretty decent size. But one of the owners, um, it's a married couple who own it, and the wife does like commentary occasionally. Mm-hmm. So after my bit with my tag team where we just beat up the good guys, I go directly over to commentary and snatch the headset off her head. And they had given me permission to just kind of do whatever kind of character work, but she didn't know what was coming. So I went to grab it, and apparently I got a tiny handful of her hair with it. <sighs> oh. Stick it on my head, shove her out of the way. I'm like, call her names, call the people names, call the announcer names, call those wrestler names. Run myself down, talk about my credentials, talk about my team, throw the headset back down, right. go get my guys. And then when I listen to it back later, the lady grabs her headset, and she's like, she pulled my hair, oh my God. And then I just talk shit about how violent I was, beat right. up the owner, tore her hair out, and I was like, it's me. I did it. I win. Yeah. It was mostly an accident, but a happy accident. An accident turned into a good thing. Yeah. yeah. It was a happy accident. Right. A happy accident. I wouldn't call it, I would call it mutually beneficial, but it was. It, it, it helped you later on. Right. It's good for me. It worked for the character. <laughs> it worked for the yeah. storyline. That's all that mattered. Yeah. Absolutely. That was about 2021 IPW Rookie of the Year. How'd you feel? Did you think you were going to win? Um, who do you, uh, who would you think for, you know, the chance of winning the award? Well, you got to understand when I was at IPW, I was the only woman in IPW for like okay. the, the two years I was there. So at that time I had just debuted. I had won the title and I'd maybe had like one other match. Okay. But it was compiling that along with all of the color commentary work, the like in-ring interview stuff I had done. We started doing some like pre-recorded. Um, I don't know if you ever saw it. It's, it's pretty old now, but it was called the uh, IPW Mental Wellness Task Force, mm-hmm. okay. uh, where Ladon Sanders and I had an office meeting. Yeah. Um, that was the introduction of my character on screen. So it was commentary, head of the IPW uh, Mental Wellness Task Force, doing some in-ring interview stuff and then wrestling winning the title. So when you put it on paper, it's like, ah, that does sound like a no-brainer. But I was just thinking, oh, all these other guys on the list have had 20 matches this year. Right. So, uh, but it was, it was very flattering. And when I look back at it now, I'm like, okay, I can see that. That, that feels pretty good. So it was, it was more than just matches. It's more like what you bring to the entire show. And right. it's kind of checking a lot of boxes. Mm-hmm. So that felt good. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Um, during your first match, so your first match was it at IPW? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, what was going through your head during your first match? Sheer and abject terror. Uh, yes, up. Scared to death. Yeah. Yep. It was a really good. It was a really good setup, though. Um, it was with Randy West. Actually, she was my oh, first okay. match. Okay. And it was cool because the year before, before the shutdown. They had had a couple of women's matches to narrow it down to like who's going to compete for the inaugural women's title. Right. And then when it came time for the match, one of the women wasn't available. So they were like, well, shit, what are we going to do? Do we have to cancel it? Do we need to reschedule? And I'm like, why would you do that when I'm like ready to debut? Right. And so that's when we pitched the idea was like, what if yeah. I get in there and I, I show everybody the belt because I'm like the yeah. women's division at that point. We pitched it to where I was going to get in and be like, I'm going to present the title to the new champion. So I'm in the ring. Here comes Randy. We're waiting around for her opponent to come out. Well, nobody comes out. So when Randy turns to look at me, gunk, hit her with the belt. We had a 10-minute match. Um, put, so to answer your question, I was just trying to remember what the hell I was supposed to be doing. Um, but Randy's a total pro, so she made it pretty easy. Um, nice. But that was my debut. It was winning the IPW belt by knocking Randy West over the head with the belt. That's crazy. Um, to start my run. Yeah. That's a that's hack awesome. of a first match and a, <laughs> and a big win right off the rap. 
that, is, that, that tops probably the John Cena ruthless aggression. <laughs> oh, maybe. I mean, in my opinion, he he clocked Kurt Angle. You clocked her with a title. That's fair. That's right. Yeah, That's that fair. was really fun, and it felt good. Like that was the first time I really got to do like. I always wondered, like, is there just somebody who writes every angle or somebody who writes like every little detail of what people do in the ring? That was the first time I pitched a whole thing and got the whole thing to go through. So it was like right down to the title shot, right down to how the match ended with her having me in a choke and me putting my feet up. Um, There's a callback to that in my fifth and like final IPW run when I dropped the title back to Randy. We had the first ever women's main event um, when IPW went to Indiana and it was my first hardcore match. That was my fifth match. So like taking thumbtacks and just taking chairs over the head and bleeding. And that was only like five months into my, yeah, in my wrestling career. So a lot of the shit I did early on, people don't realize like how new I was, but I was brand new, like brand, brand new. Wow. Would you do a hardcore match again if the opportunity presented itself? Absolutely. I would hundred percent. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who are some wrestlers that you haven't got the opportunity to step in the ring with that you'd like to, if possible? Well, I, I mean, it started at the very tip of the top. Like, I've had my fantasy fantasy. Absolutely. Um, God, I love, I love Sasha. I love Monet so much. She's one of my absolute favorites. Um, so I think it'd be fun with her. Um, and I think because just because of size, I'm 5'11". I think Rhea Ripley is like 5'10", 5'11", or 5'9". That'd be a good one. Yeah. That'd be fun. I had people yell at me in Chicago one time, like, call me like a Rhea Ripley wannabe. I'm like, I'm twice her age. I've looked like this forever. Shut up. She's right. <laughs> she's, she's famous, but she's trying to look like me. It's, it's she's bad. getting it from me. All right. That's right. Yeah, they're all still. It's all me. I'm not a narcissist at all. No. <laughs> um, but so that would be fun. I'm more of a local level. Um, okay. You know, it's funny too, is like I was out and doing stuff in Michigan almost a year before like the whole new crop showed up with like Stella and like Heather and I wrestled fairly early on. But a lot of the others like Rory and um, um, there's some others who are starting to come up. I was almost a year ahead of them. So like I didn't really get a lot of interaction there. Um, Locally speaking, I mean, there's like, it would have been realistic to face like Sky Blue in Chicago. Like she still does local stuff. Yeah. Um, I guess this is me realizing I don't really do uh, I don't really do wish lists all that much. Like, I got to wrestle Melanie Cruz, which was really cool. I wrestled um, uh, Jessica Havoc for crying out loud. So like, mm-hmm. uh, I had some I had some bigger names. Um, Angel yeah. Metro I had a match with. Um, yes. well, yeah, I, know, I guess I don't spend a lot of time thinking of it that way. I just think about like what's possible. Jessica uh, Jessica Havoc. She's a regular here down here in Monroe. Mm. If you ever come back, that'd be cool to match the sea down here. She's such a sweetheart. I love her to death. And it's a bummer because when we wrestled each other, I was so sick. Like I have ongoing um, diverticulitis, like major stomach issues, mm. which is why I decided to hang it up. It just yeah. wasn't getting better. But when I wrestled her, I couldn't have been, I wasn't even 50%. Like, oh, okay. Our match was fun, but it was like 10 minutes of character work and like five moves because I was just so like basically injured. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was really cool wrestling her and wrestling Melanie and wrestling Angel uh, Blair Onyx is another good one I wrestled from Chicago that was the stuff that made me go okay I can like I can hang on the national level um, that felt good I think I made it easier to hang it up when I decided to because I don't have a lot of questions of like what if or could I because I already know yeah I could I just I, I'm old <laughs> And my stomach hurts and I can't keep my brain working long enough. I got mental health issues. It's hard. You know what I mean? Like it was just really hard. Um, but I don't lose any sleep thinking about it. Cause I know I was pretty good at it. I don't have to wonder. With, yeah. um, would you, could you see yourself doing like per se, like a wrestling seminar, like just talking about like mental health and wrestling things like that? I could absolutely see myself doing it. I don't know how many people would attend it, mm-hmm. but I could see myself doing it. I mean, that's kind of what I've done professionally for, you know, I used to work at like the community mental health agencies, both in Kalamazoo and Berrien County. Um, so doing like mental health education has been a big deal for me for literal decades. In the wrestling circles, people kind of hear what they want to hear when they're ready to, when they're ready to hear it. Okay. So I'd be happy to have a conversation with anybody who wants to have it. 
as part of the psychologist part, have you used that to help any wrestlers or help yourself at all? Like during your time with wrestling? A lot actually. Yeah. 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 I've got a couple of friends who I continue to um, talk to very, very frequently who, I mean, I talk to my friends about stuff anyway, but if I find out there's other folks suffering from things that I might have some expertise in, I'm definitely going to try to reach out and help. Um, as, a, but, as a, sorry, as a psychologist and a wrestler, what was um like? What would you say your biggest piece of advice would be for a wrestler? Oof. Um, don't just pay attention to your physical health. Okay. Um, it's, it's you know you'll hear people say black and white statements about wrestling is the best thing in the world or it's awful or it's, it just depends on the person's experience. Right. My experience was that it's very much like any kind of giant like massive multi player online thing where like you can see all these other people playing the same game as you, you can choose right. who to engage with. Um, some people want to get paired up, you know, in tag teams, you can be on the road with people. It makes it more fun, makes it easier. Factions make things easier. Um, I'm one of those people I like to do things alone a lot. So I tend to like kind of do my own thing, but I think for anybody, I would say every locker room has its own politics or pressures. If you ever feel like you shouldn't do a thing, but you're afraid you're going to lose your spot or you're afraid you're going to lose respect or you're afraid. I would tell anybody you got to prioritize yourself and your physicality and your mental health because you can't do this other stuff if this don't work. Right. And and I'm a poster child for that now. I ignored my own stuff for a year and I just crashed and hit a wall where I just couldn't do any of it anymore. Um, but that's hard to tell people because really what it means is anytime you don't feel ready to do a thing, you should look at this company owner who you've been scraping by and scrambling to try to get a job with and say, I can't do it. There's 10 people waiting to knock you out of the way and jump in your spot. Right. So it's very, very difficult to self prioritize. Um, but that's, you know what I mean? That's, that's the struggle in wrestling. Will I prioritize my health or will I just keep going? Pushing. Mm -hmm. Male or well, male and female. Who do you think you have? Who do you think you have the best ring chemistry with? Mm, that's a fun question. Um, let me think about that for a second. Male, you know what? I only had a couple matches with guys, but my friend um, okay. Casey Tempest, he got trained as well with Josh here at IPW. I helped do a lot of his training. Okay. And uh, we had a pretty fun match. Um, that was my first babyface match actually when I came back to IPW. Um, I wasn't feeling very good that day either, but Oof. just partially, you know, just from training together, you just, you know, you know, it's funny. I just thought of this in training. It's not just who you get chemistry with, but part of who you had good chemistry with is who you realize you can kind of like beat up a little bit. So okay. like if you trust each other, like actually lay it in, yep. we just basically made chemistry. Cause now I can put you where I need you or whatever. Okay. And, yeah. and with him being a bigger guy, I trusted like he wants to do a big power slam. I'll jump because I know he's going to get me around or okay. um, when he's on the top rope and I come over to do like the, the soup, like, I don't know. We had a way of working out. So that was really easy. Didn't have to think about it. Yeah. Um, as far as chemistry with women go, I mean, the easy thing to say again would be Stella Bujo, who also came from IPW, who I also assisted with some training, um, but probably Randy just yeah, yeah. because of that first match. By the time I had that fifth match with her, it felt like I had really, gotten more comfortable got my feet under me i wish there'd been more than 20 people in that room god damn it it was a good match <laughs> there were like 20 people scattered all over this gymnasium but that was a good match if there were one thing you could change about the wrestling industry currently what would you change and why reese what's my answer uh i would assume because i know you said that you've had you know some struggles with per se, you know, wrestlers, promoters, I, I would say any like backstage politics. I mean, I don't know if that would be what you'd say, but backstage politics, you know, stop being like per se cutthroat, you know, allow them to compete. I mean, per se, I mean, I don't know if that helps at all, but. It definitely does. Okay. I would say that I, the very first thing I would say is, and this is only cause I'm a, a female wrestler, but all of this stuff we see when people post memes on Facebook that say like they're here to work, they're not here to flirt. A yeah. lot of the same people who post those go right to the next show and do it anyway. It's this is where I want to be careful because it makes me sound very, very bitter. 
But all I'll say on the topic is that in colleges, there's a reason like feminism and women's studies tend to be in the same class. Um, wrestling is a male dominated sport and business. Right. We just watched and are continuing to watch this whole Vince McMahon fiasco play out. And as a therapist and a wrestler who's been in locker rooms and been around people and heard what we talk about, I can't describe how angry it makes me when I see people in and around the industry say, how could this have happened? How could this have happened like this? Because wrestling politics make it impossible to point anything out without getting blackballed. Because if you say that woman got fucked over, you're going to get treated just like she did. Ask Ethan Hubbard. <laughs> like it's, it is designed almost to not allow women in unless your eye candy you're going to be a valley to get some other guy over. I hate to say it, but somebody wants to, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, I, it, this sounds, it sounds like sour grapes, but it just is what it is. Mm -hmm. And we could say, well, maybe more women need to start companies, but that still feels like separate but equal type stuff. It feels like another drinking fountain-ish. Right. It's like, why can't we just finally integrate here? Um so the answer you gave would technically cover that, but I think hyper specifically, you know, you, you can tell me, but I think masculinity is redefining itself. And I don't think that Vince McMahon and, and Bruce Pritchard and Jim Cornette's masculinity really exist in people 40 years or younger anymore. And I think that the politics and the norms can shift because the generational culture is shifting. Mm -hmm. um, but if it doesn't shift, we're going to keep hearing stories like Ashley Mazzaro yeah. forever. Right. You know? I know a very popular promoter in Detroit and people go to their shows consistently. And a lot of people who work in the industry know damn well about that person's accusations and everybody knows it. And they'll still go to the shows and they'll just not say the person's name so they can have plausible deniability. And I'm just like, I don't know how you sleep at night, but okay. Go ahead. All right. Interesting. Yeah. And we, we definitely need, you know, more wrestlers and individuals like you to voice, you know, these, you know, these things so that it becomes equal. You know, all wrestlers should be treated equally no matter what. Yeah. But then I feel bad because people, I mean, I appreciate you saying that, but here I am. And I just decided to bounce out of it because. I mean, you can also, if you, I mean, if you felt like it, I mean, you could always, you know, there's advocates outside of the ring, you know, the former wrestlers doing that. I mean, if you true. ever felt like doing that, I mean, cause you could obviously be a, a voice and sort of like lack of a better word, like a beacon of hope per se. You know? I think it would make more sense to do it now that I'm not actively wrestling, I think if you try to do it while you're wrestling, you're just going to get yourself blacklisted. Because mm -hmm. um, then, you know, there's the chance, like, if you get into a ring with a wrestler, they could sabotage the match to where you get hurt, you know, or something might happen during the match. Good. I don't even know that you would make it to a match, though, to be completely honest. I just think word would spread very quickly. Mm -hmm. Here's a great example. Um, I'm not going to say who it was, but there's a really, really talented young wrestler in Detroit who should make a lot of money sometime in the next five years. And that person decided to do a match for a company. I don't know why he did, but the company stiffed him on his pay and it was a rough, like a death match situation. And this company is notorious for doing this. And so me, I don't work there and I have a big mouth. So I jumped on Facebook. I was like, Hey, these people are doing it again. Named them, you know? And that was the day I found out that there were promoters from around the Midwest who would rather come on to, I'm a, I'm a relative unknown, but come on and tell me that you'd have less than 10 years of experience, shut your mouth. You're new around here. You're a nobody. You don't even have the right to express these thoughts. And I'm like, you understand that what I'm saying is that kid bled for free and we should pay him. Right. Why am I being targeted as a, as a toxic drama problem? Do you want that kid to bleed and get happy, not get paid? Is that what you're telling me? So that's the kind of stuff. It's like, I would love to advocate. I'm not convinced. 
I don't know who I'm advocating for. I'm not convinced people on the inside want it changed. I, right. mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know where my place would be in that. Sounds like, like he said, you're a leader or a beacon yeah. of light waiting for your followers and mm -hmm. your, Cause there's your group to gather with you. Because mm -hmm. there's definitely, you know, it's not just one. There's multiple stories. You they know. just don't want to stand up yet. People. It could be, you know, they might reveal it when they're done wrestling. You know, like well down the line, and that it shouldn't be that way because then, say for instance, that they reveal it twenty years from now, well, how is that going to affect the next generation of wrestlers? Or how has it already? Affected or you know, them? what if the same thing's happening to them? Right, like people are just now finally talking about Ashley Mazzaro, and that happened mm -hmm. twenty years ago. But it's not like nobody was talking about it. Paul London's talked about it on on recorded. I mean, dozens of times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the mind blowing stuff. It's like even when you talk, speak out, it can just keep getting swept if people aren't ready, you know, I mean, to hear it. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it, you know, and I, I think that my message, it's not just my message, it's a very common sense message. But mm -hmm. that was another part of me deciding to step out of it was, you know, part of the reason I became a therapist and I'm so passionate about victim advocacy is that, like, I've got my own mental health issues for a reason, I've got victim background. And so for me to be in, to be in a building or in a locker room with people and know that there's a thief right there, we all know it. There's a person with sexual assault allegations right there, and we all know it. Um, and nobody's going to say anything to protect this young woman who just started working here or tell people not to put their bags over there because shit might get stolen. And the rules are I'm not allowed to say anything. That puts me back in a traumatized mindset of I needed people to speak up when I needed some help. And now I'm being part and complicit of pretending there's not a problem happening here. It was just breaking my brain. Um, and that's a very specifically me problem. I don't want to say that's a wrestling issue. That's a me being a heavily traumatized person issue. Um, but that's the stuff like I would love to be that voice, but to say it into a room and have everybody look the other direction just makes it even worse again. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't know. 100%. Um, what would be on your Mount Rushmore of wrestling? And hey. um, so I know you're probably interested and excited for this. So you can do it either way you want, but I'll just let you know. Usually when we ask people, we do it a certain way. So we have you pick a main star. Um, like a, a mid card champion type of star, a tag team, which would be, you know, those two people, and then a female. So five all together. Okay. So that basically be like my all time, just like top, top person. And then we're saying like mid card. Like, thing. In, in a way, yeah, be, basically. Yes. Or like I said, you could pick one or you could pick a few. But like that's the way we do it. It's like usually one big, one main, a middle, a, a tag team or two, and then your female. That way you cover okay. basically all the bases. Yeah. Well, I can tell you right now, my all-time favorite tag team was ECW era um, Dudley Boys. Okay. Yes. Nice. It's weird for me. I'm like, I'm like, the pick queen, with the, I'm the good picks of, so far. Yeah, I'm politically correct as can be, but yeah, when Bubba Ray is popping off, like, yo. Oh yeah. Um, so give me that for sure, um, and then more, more recent. Give me the Lucha Brothers. Okay. Nice. Nice. I don't, people can talk shit about AEW all they want. I'm like, oh. Tell that to tell that to Mexico. Right. <laughs> They've been doing this for a century. Get out of here. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, so give me that. Um, Thanks. As far as women, give me Mercedes Monet. Okay. Um, Jamie Hayter. Nice. Or let me think about old school here. Um, Blast from the past. Old school. <sighs> Ready. This is a this is a fringe choice. I don't care. Um, I I think Alicia Fox is criminally underrated. Oh, nice. Okay. I think she's like criminally underrated. So from the last mm -hmm. thirty years or so, give me Alicia Fox. A good one. Um, for mid title types, people might get mad at this. I would put Dusty somewhere between that one and the tippy top. Mm -hmm. Okay, hundred um, percent. But as far as like the mid goes, that's where I'm going to put my. Um, Zack Sabre Jr. Okay. My yeah. Samoa Joe. Nice. Um, CM Punk is in there. Daniel Bryan is in there. Um, this is going to turn to a big wad. Oh, that's okay. No, you're good. There's like packing pieces on like Voltron here. <laughs> um, 
Jake the Snake Roberts when I was a little kid, like when he was evil heel Snake yeah. Roberts. That was great. You know, when he just taught quietly and slow. <laughs> well, there was that, but there was like, and I'm going to go to Macho Man's fucking wedding and ruin it. Yeah. Yep. That, <laughs> that was great. You yeah. Right. Yep. She opened up the lid and Damien was in there. Yep. Evil. Just evil, evil. Mm-hmm. I don't care about Randy Orton that much, but when he was a heel back when he was like going after yeah. Triple H, remember yes. when he handcuffed Triple H and he made out with unconscious yeah. yep. shit that I would never approve of in real life. Uh, yeah, for some era. reason, I'm like, ah. Uh, 2010. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Era. Um, so I'm not talking like tippy tippity tippy top. Um, now we got our main stars. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, you Give said a lot me. of technical, so. Yeah, but so that I'm. Um, if it changes. Do you all know? This is going to sound so weird, even to somebody who. Do you know Kenta Kobashi? Yes. I do. He had a match against Samoa Joe in New York um, at Ring of Honor mm-hmm. where they pulled the commentary out of it because it was so wild. It was like, yeah. you don't need it. It was just wild. That was my first time seeing him and then going back and watching some of his classic stuff, realizing how fundamental he is, what a huge baby face he is, the moves he uses where nobody's allowed to use them because they're literally lethal. Right. He has such a mystique. Like I honestly would probably put him like way, way, way up there. That's um, a great pick. Oh yeah. hundred percent. But yeah. then when it comes to like stone cold or the rock or like the attitude era stuff, Mm-hmm. I wasn't that. I mean, I watched during that era. Um, right. I, you know, the sports entertainment thing didn't do it for me quite as much. So honestly, probably even then, it was like when Benoit beat Triple H and HBK at Mania. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So I probably would. It would probably be like Kenny Kobashi. I would probably say like Bret Hart's title run, like when he was on top. I liked him better right. than HBK. I'd put Bret Hart up there. That's fair. Um, and then as far as like WCW goes from back in the day, I would go with Crow Sting for sure. Um, and Raven. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I was forget about Raven. Raven's flock for sure. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, before our interview, before tonight, I went back and watched a bunch of your matches just to sort of get refresh my memory. Okay. And one match stuck out to me above the rest, and it was your match with Juniper Gates. Oh, okay. So uh, how did it, as a, a transgender wrestler, how did it feel to be in the ring with a fellow transgender wrestler? And it was for the IPW women's title, correct? It was, yeah. yeah. And so there, was some, well, there was some chatter, and I'm still not sure. That might have been the first time that ever happened. I'm not sure. I think it was because I, I saw, I, I looked at it, and they said it was like the first time two transgender wrestlers fought for a women's belt. Yeah. Well, you know, this really sucks to say, but my main concern Mm-hmm. was that there would be people in the crowd laughing because they might say some shit about there aren't any women in the ring. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? That was always a concern. I never dealt with that my whole time wrestling, and I'm not sure Junie has either, but that was sadly one of the main things on my mind was just don't let that happen. You know what I mean? I don't want to deal with that. Um, I was very new. That was like my second match. Mm-hmm. So like, I'm glad you liked it. I watch it back and I go, oh my God, I, I, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. Um, but beyond that, it was amazing. Like, we definitely took that in. We took that part seriously. Like, yo, sis, here we are doing the thing. Um, so historically, I feel really good about it. I still have that anxiety memory. And um, I think as time passes, I'll just be like, you know what? Even if it wasn't the very first one, it's a pretty cool thing to be able to say. Like, one of the first times two trans women did it. That's, that's very cool. And that's that was actually my first time I discovered you. I saw the logo. It was of you like stretching Junie's face, and it said "Queen of the oh. Kingdom." That was the, <laughs> yeah. that was how I first discovered Davis and Sarai. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I gotta I, check this girl out, and I did. I wanted all my images to be me just torturing people, just straight up like stretching them and ripping. Yeah, it was uh, that was that was a great picture. I know you put it on T-shirts, and yeah, that's that all of my merch. I felt kind of bad, too, because I forgot to ask her at first. And then all of a sudden, I got all this shit coming out. I'm like, oh, God, Junie, are you okay with the fact that I'm, like, beating you up and everybody's everything? Right. She's like, yeah, it's totally fine. Um, that was actually, at the end of that match, was the first time I got to do my little fantasy of, like, the heel kind of melting at the end. Like, okay, she put up a really good fight. Let's give her a little round of applause. I help her up, and then I smack her and give her another pal driver. <laughs> <laughs> 
I did. Lifelong goal brought to life. Yeah. I was like, ah. yeah. That, that, that's yeah. I remember that. That was real. Uh, that's probably I would say my favorite match. One of my favorite matches of yours. Uh huh. That's awesome. I think my personal favorite match I had was probably the one I had with Blair Onyx, um, just because it was the most probably like elaborate kind of tech. Well, I mean, I got pretty technical with Jocelyn Navarro as well. Yeah. But yeah, I, I like a lot of them. some of them I can't watch. I watched mm-hmm. with uh with Charlie Cruel. I can't watch it. God, I was terrible in that. I can't do it. But it all exists. It's mm-hmm. on the internet somewhere. You can find it. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like you kind of answered one part of this, but I'm going to still ask it. Um, so this is a two, two-parter. What's one or two of your proudest matches that you've taken a part of, and what's one or two that you're willing to talk about that you're not so happy with that you were a part of? I got a whole list for that second part. Um, I'm really proud that if it was, in fact, my last match, that my last match was getting Stella over to Chicago where she's now going to be doing it regularly. It looks like, okay. but getting to kind of help her break in helping with the training in Michigan. A lot of the women are over on the East side. So they're doing Detroit or like Toledo right. or Canada. I was over here trying to do Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, which I did, but I was kind of the only one over here doing it. So getting to open that door a little bit and get some Michigan people over feels really good. Okay. Um, doing that hardcore match with Randy, it feels good to look back and be able to be like, yo, I had 30 thumbtacks stuck in me, <laughs> blood on it. Like, I that feels like an accomplishment. Um, things I don't feel great about, like I just said, I mean, I can think back because I just it was weird because I had my character on lock so fast that I think there was a disconnect of people thinking your character is like you've been doing this for 10 years but you wrestle like you just showed up. And that was a constant insecurity for me. It was like, oh, if my matches don't look like they match up to this other stuff, I'm going to feel weird. So like the Junie match pops out for me. The Crystal Lane match pops out. We're both so new. Um, but then by the time, you know, the second Randy match came around, basically everything passed, that felt pretty good about. Um, I used to be embarrassed about spitting on that kid in Indiana. I feel pretty okay about it now. He deserved it. Um, Wasn't your fault. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Heidenreich, I, I should pick that kid up and kick him in the crowd. Oh, my fault! Yeah, right. Um, Do you like what Gene Snitsky, uh, what Snitsky yeah. did to the yeah, yeah, yeah. kid? <laughs> kick him and punk hit the baby into the crowd. That's one of my all-time favorite wrestling oh, memories oh. right there. Just, I, can't, I can't even imagine if whoever caught the baby <laughs> realized it wasn't a real baby. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully first. they... I bet they told him where to kick it. So, Probably. So that it, and I bet they had a couple people plan it throughout the, throughout the arena to finally right. catch it. Was it was a dark area. No one was there. So it just landed uh, in like well, a seat. You know what would have been, what would have been great is if when he kicked it, the lights went out. <laughs> just the lights went out and they had like a sensor or something on. Like, okay, the ba- the doll's over here. Yeah. And they just start playing this, like crying. Yeah, like they're crying, but it's, but then all of a sudden it just stops. Yeah. Um, you know, actually, I, I'm going back to it now. I might have fucked my entire career up ever so slightly the first time I ever touched a live microphone in Detroit because I had already kind of established over on the west side, and a lot of workers from the east side had come and worked for IPW, so I was kind of known. But the first time they gave me a live microphone, whoo, I went off for like 10 minutes, which is way too long. But I just wanted to basically heal promo the entire city of Detroit instead of like a person. So I was like, fuck Metro Pro Wrestling, fuck Horror Slam, fuck <laughs> fuck right. 15 federations and three straight and three city blocks. Fuck the same 10 people on every show. Just like as mean and dismissive as humanly possible. And like it pissed people off, but not in the way I thought it was going to. Right. That was that was a wrestling thing. Right. Mm-hmm. They didn't take it and all the shoot it they, well. everybody took it very, very, very yeah. personally. Yeah. And I'm not sure anybody ever got over it. And I was like, well, don't you watch that. wrestling? Like, right. what do you, yeah. So I don't feel bad about doing it, but if I could take it back, that probably would have changed the trajectory of things for me in <laughs> Detroit. Um, but, you know, I guess I can say I was such a heel that I just bombed, you know, I worked the, I worked the boys, I don't know, whatever. Uh, what advice would you offer a transgender individuals who want to uh, work in the wrestling industry? 
Mm. Mm. Make sure you have done enough self-work that you can handle your dysphoria. Okay. Um, you, you guys both know what that is. You're just, the dysphoria is like the psychological aspect. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, for a lot of trans people, it's just hard to go out, especially with the politics and things that are happening right now. Like it can be scary. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like, you have to be able to keep yourself together just for your life to work, let alone the hardship of like the physical aspects of wrestling let alone the nervous aspects of doing that in front of people, let alone the possibility of people want to fuck with you. Or, um, and one of my concerns too, is I work out of the state all the time. What happens if I break down in Indiana? Right. What happens if somebody asks me why I'm using that bathroom in Ohio? Like, I don't, I don't know how that would go. Um, so I would tell people like, if you are having any questions about your social confidence, this is going to make it, it'll either make it better. It's going to make it a hundred times worse. Um, be really, really, really selective in who you work for. You know, like there, there might be some people who'd be willing to have you work there because we have some marketability. But I definitely know there are some people who might be willing to hire trans people who would 100% vote against us and tell other people to vote against us come election time. So I would just say be really selective of, of who and where. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of people doing it. You know, we're starting to break through. So. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a, a non-wrestling question, more of just uh, per, not well, not really personal. But uh, your bio says that you're a tattoo enthusiast. Mm -hmm. uh, how old were you when you got your first tattoo? Ooh, I was old actually. That's a really good question. I was like in my mid twenties. Okay. Um, I was gonna be like, I'm such the I'm such the contrarian. You know this about me. I was like everybody punk rock got tattoos. I want to be so punk. I don't even get tattoos. I'm going to like reverse. I'm going to mm -hmm. do the whole thing. Right. Um, but then I was in this band for a long time and we all wanted to get like a little matching, like commemorative thing. So the very first thing I ever got was that little oh, design yeah. right there. Okay. That was it. That was going to be the only thing I ever got. And you weren't even wow. gonna be able to see it unless I showed it to you. Right. And then within about a week, I was like, yeah, but now I feel off balance. I need another one. <laughs> And I'm going to do it over here, but now it feels weird. I'm going to do it over there. And then, yeah. Uh, so how, if, if you know, how many do you have? <sighs> That's a good one. Let's do it. Well, you know, we'll do it right now. Um, we'll do it. So let's, uh, we got one, we got two, we got three, we got four, we got five. This was six from here to here. Mm -hmm. This is seven. Um, I start losing track. So that's seven. Um, now you have you have one on your hand, correct? Back of my hand. Mm -hmm. I have two on each finger, so that's uh, eight more. So that's sixteen. I just got my thumbs done yesterday. That's eighteen. Oh. I got three more bugs. That's uh, what is that? Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Twenty-two. Twenty-three. Uh, 28, 29, 30, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I lost, where was I? 35? 35. 35. And I've got something like seven or eight little bugs crawling up on my hip over here, which puts me over 40. So, yeah, I'm that 40 range. Wow. Do you have a favorite one? <laughs> it, that's a three part. This is a three parter question. But... I think it's probably my throat. Actually, okay. I, got, I got that done over the um, shutdown. Oh, yeah. That's a really cool one. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. It's very controversial. It's like the um, it's called like the Satan cross. I was gonna say uh, one of yeah one of my friends has that right here actually, and yeah. at the same spot. Yeah. And I was like, that's really cool. And then they're like, do you know what it is? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but but it's the thing. Like, I, Satanism is not even really about Satan. It's like a whole individual. It is yeah. kind of vibe. Um, but also I like it because I'm trans and I'm queer and evangelical Christian types hate us. So I'm like, guess what? I hate you too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very positive message. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Reese, I'm not being. That is a really cool tattoo. I mean, all your ink looks really cool though. Thank you. This is actually really cute. You won't be able to see it because it's backwards, but I got, where's my camera? There it is. Right there. BB. Nice. This is kind of cute, like a little nickname you have for like your boyfriend, your girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and cool. I got these three little 
bugs on my hand yesterday. My friend May is an artist. Nice. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Right. Oh, yeah, that's really cool. That bee is called Mr. Fuzzbutt. That <laughs> that uh, ladybug is called Alfred, a.k.a. Uh, Apple Bottom Jeans. <laughs> and the bottom bug there is called uh, Butt Boy. <laughs> Butt Boy. And Butt Boy's uh, back feet are huge. He wears a size 13. And yes. on Alfred's back is a teeny tiny little Cupid's oh, yeah. arrow. Because oh, he's, yeah. rom- he's a romantic. Wow. That's nice. Crazy. <laughs> That's really cool. I've got, <laughs> I've got two tattoos. What about you, Reese? Uh, no ink on me. <laughs> I've got... No. It's addictive. It's addictive. Keep it that way. For real. I got one. I thought I was done. And I was like, Mom, what do you want? I'm getting one for you. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. There's another little one right there, too. I always want okay. to get a, Mon- a Monroe piercing. My skin doesn't like it. So I just got a little tattoo instead. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to I'm gonna kind of go back into wrestling a little bit. <laughs> he, sure. he, kinda, he did the shenanigans part by going off in tattoos and other stuff. Mm-hmm. We'll bring us back to wrestling for a moment. Um. So you've been doing this for three years now, correct? Almost. Uh, right, yeah, off and on. I started with IPW in 2019. 2019. So okay. Yeah, like four. Well, four a little years bit longer. Months, okay. So as a as a veteran of about four to five years now, um, do you see yourself going back? Whether it's other as a superstar, as a manager, or even possibly as like you know a trainer, possibly. I am talking to my friend John, and we agreed. He agreed at the time, and we'll see. But I told him I was real, real, real burned out on wrestling. Okay. And I asked if he would consider having me as a heel color commentator. Oh, that would be um, interesting. Too. Okay. He, he said he's going to try to run like six or eight shows a year, so it's not that intensive. Okay. But he's like family. He's one of my very favorite people I've met in wrestling. We talk almost every single day. Right. And he really focuses on locker room. He's a positive person who wants pros around him. That's the kind of environment I can thrive in. So right. that's the plan is to do some commentary with him. You can help with commentary and promos and stuff like that. Easily, yeah. Um, Would you be open I, to like training and helping with training though? For like whether like male, female, so. no matter who they are, what they are, just you know, training so. helping in general. <clears throat> I think so. I really enjoy the training aspect. Um, and like I said, I wasn't even thinking about wrestling. It was almost more like taking Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or right. kickboxing class. It was like, so the, the mechanics of technical wrestling specifically, it's kind of almost like ballroom dance. So you have to do it exactly right. And you have to be in the right place. You, you need a dance partner for that to work. Right. Um, I could see myself being very happy helping to train people in technical wrestling you know what I mean? I don't know if it'll happen because just the general atmosphere, vibe, personality of wrestling, I, I, I'm i still trying to consider how much I fit there. Right. So as much as I like doing that, I need to be honest with, do I fit? Is it going to be good for me? Um, and if I get to a place where I feel good about it, yeah, I'd love to do that. If um, if you didn't per se help with like the physical training of it, well, could you see yourself or would you be interested in doing like per se character or gimmick development because you did like a real heel? Could you, would you see yourself doing that helping with character development? Very happily, very happily. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't talk about it, but there's the, the um, Indie Idol, like the annual promo competition. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried out, I was going to try out for that a couple of years ago. And my wrestling trainer at the time was like, don't, you don't need to mess around with that. Like, why? He's like, well, this is going to sound a little rough, but his advice was always like, try to put yourself on shows and on cards. You want people to see you like how you want to be seen. Right. And so his whole thing was like, you can go to all these shows and be around all these people, or you can go to like one show every once in a while and be seen with these people like just work on how you're seeing in terms of scarcity. He was like, you're going to be overexposed. There's going to be people on there who aren't that good. So if you beat them, who cares? And if they beat you, that's bad. And I was like, oh, well, then I'll just beat everybody. That's, that's fine. And I did. And that led to then being able to coach the next season. And that was really fun because I had contestants hit me up almost every day asking for tips on this or on this or on this. Um, and getting to give that advice and watch them do it week to week 
and watch the promos get better and better. Like, yeah, I really enjoy that aspect of it. So I could definitely see that. It's well, great. What were some of the bigger struggles that you had to overcome and, you know, uh, to succeed in, you know, becoming a wrestler and following this, you know, dream of yours? Oh, goodness. Um, it sounds weird. I just had a person ask me the other day, like, what the hardest part of wrestling was. And, and they said, was it, you know, was it the ring? Is it the this? Is it the, like, they were just talking about the physical stuff. Right. I just keep coming back to, I learned a lot about my own limitations as a wrestler. Um, I think I made the mistake of thinking that because I'm a therapist and because I, you know, I've overcome a lot in life and, and abuse and this and that, the other thing, transition is hard to do. Like, fuck, if I can do all that stuff, this shouldn't be that bad. Right. But then I realized that just the grind and the anxiety and the competition and the dysphoria and, you know, I mean, all that stuff. Um, I just realized I went back down my rabbit hole and I forgot what your question was. I'm sorry. I, I, I go on this spiral with it. it, it no, you're fine. What was your question? Um, what's what, what were some of the bigger obstacles that you had to obstacles. face and overcome? Yeah, I think that's what I'm describing. I think me. <laughs> okay. I think we can become our own main obstacle sometimes. Well, yeah, mainly just trying to push yourself and, you know, keep going. I was refusing I'll get to know to, who you are. Was like I was driving a car and all the lights on the dash were saying right. attention. And I was just ignoring that because, you know, my, my friend put it really well. He said, you were trying to speed run a wrestling career. It was like when I started at 44, we all talk about Diamond Dallas Page being yep. a badass for starting at like 38 or whatever his thing was. I'm like, mm -hmm. pussy, come yeah. on. So and by the time I hit 47, 48 and I'm having a hard time. It's like, it's hard to say I can't. It's right. real hard, especially when all this has already been done and the money and the miles and the gas and the relationships and the booking and the, you've done all of this. How do you just hand it off? Because if your body and brain don't work, you can't do any of it anyway. Right. And I think it's a good lesson. And this is why I'm, I'm trying to talk to people about it. I, I don't want to down. I don't want to like crap on wrestling and make it seem like it's not important because it is. Right. Mm -hmm. But for every person, their life should be more important. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and if you start ignoring your life or your well being for this other thing, it can't work that way. It all comes through you. Um, right. So people learning the humility to be able to say, "Fuck, I really want this dream," but if it's going to wreck me physically. Right. It's going to wreck me mentally, emotionally, and wreck the rest of my life. I need to learn how to say, "I, this isn't for me." It's really hard to do. Right. Well, this is going to be an interesting one, and I'm kind of curious on if you'd be able to answer it and how you'd answer it. But uh, we've read and heard so much about you know past performers uh, retiring and wanting to come back, or even coming back and then retiring, such as Flair, Sting, Michaels. Um, there's another one going around. Most recently, The Undertaker, who's retired, and he says it's very difficult for him to go to wrestling events and not, you know, fight the urge in his head and his body to want to come back. So, as a therapist slash psychologist, what would you, you know, type of what, what was what would some of the stuff you'd say or you'd recommend for you know those type of people who have retired or you know can't do it but want to do it, and like what would you do or what would you say for them to like try to fight against, and then how would you help them? Like psychology lies with their, like with what they're thinking and how to proceed. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I've thought of that for a long time because we hear about like musicians mm -hmm. who reach a certain age and they just decide to retire because they're at a certain yeah. age. But then you see other people who go to the grave still doing shows because they just can't let it go. Right. And I mean, we all thought Flair was going to die in that match. Done. I don't know about you, but he looked. Oh yeah. Like he died yeah. In that match. yeah. 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 It was. It was brutal. Absolutely. Pretty rough. Pretty rough. So Flair is a person. I don't think there's any disputing. He would dispute it, but he'd be wrong. Yeah. He's he's been an alcoholic for decades. He has an addictive yep. mindset, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's nothing more addictive than fame. Right. Like I've never been famous. Famous. 
but I've been like small town famous where my band was big enough to do like a, a national tour and I could be known in multiple states. Like right. it's not famous, but it's like small town famous. Right. And even just going away from that to back just like a normal life where you're not getting adrenaline every night, the center of the show, all these people recognizing you, it does feel slower. Life can feel a little more dull in comparison. Right. Or you can be a person who doesn't have addictive mindset and it's just like, well, that's over. I'm on to the next thing. Right. I'm not surprised the Undertaker's already talking about coming back. I mean, what's it been? It's a year? Yeah, yeah about a year. A year, a little over a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw I saw that on YouTube on my feed, something about Undertaker wanting to come back. Mm -hmm. And the very first thing I thought was, is there a need? Right. Do you have to? What do you need to prove? Well, more so to me, does wrestling need the Undertaker right now? That's and I think it. the yeah. answer is no. No. Nah. And so that's where it turns into more of the human story of like, well, okay. should he? Right. And that's and I'm like, well, should he? You tell me. He quit for a reason. Why did he quit? Because his body doesn't work. Then maybe he shouldn't. He's getting to that age, yeah. and yeah, his body wasn't working too well. Yeah. I mean, he said it, so, and I believe he said in a documentary, his he doesn't wake up with a day a day without pain. His legs right. hurt. His back hurts. His hands yeah. hurt. Always in the morning. Everything. It's usually always in the morning. Oh, yeah, of course, like, you lactic oh, acids and yeah. they're just laying still. And, yeah. Kurt Angle said that he his neck hurts every day. I mean, I know he broke it, but like his back hurts every day. Yeah. I, I only wrestled for a couple of years. My neck hurts every single day. My yeah. my ankle hurts every day. <laughs> um, but it's like I didn't retire saying my body doesn't work. I, mm -hmm. So when somebody pops out and then right away wants to come back in, that's what tells me like this isn't. I don't think this is about you missing wrestling. I think you're just missing the juice. You're missing the, yeah. the thrill. And it's yeah. like, it's like when sting and Ric Flair and those guys come back, they always get big pops. So yeah. they obviously feed off of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's no denying what they had or what talent they have, but there's gotta be a, a sort of, sort of like breaking point, you know? Well, unfortunately it tends to come in the form of your spine or your legs yeah. or, your, yeah. You know, one but, of the more um, serious things, but you sort of gotta stop before it. You know, you you might you unfortunately could end up in a wheelchair. You could end up with a cane. You could anything. end up with a walker. Yeah. Anything like that. That's why you gotta and stop. I, and I think we can admit that there's a fair amount of romanticizing of that in wrestling, especially in wrestling fans, like hardcore wrestling fans. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could find a hardcore wrestling fan who would say a wrestler should retire when they're not like fully physically functional. I think a lot of people would say, well, hell brother, you should wrestle right into the wheelchair. That's yeah. And that's, that's what the old timers did. And I'm like, they sure did. And yeah. a lot of them died and overdosed and went to jail and have addiction and have 24 mm -hmm. seven pain. Like you're saying. And, um, and that's, that's, that's why it should sort of alert staying at Ric Flair and undertaker, even though undertaker is one of my favorites. You got to, there's, there has to be a point where you got to stop. So I'm not even a huge Undertaker fan at this point, but for you, would it impact maybe not even your fanhood, but just the way you see him conceive of the Undertaker, if he comes back now, a shell of a shell of his former self. If he comes I back, I mean, of course the, you know, the 10 year old me would be really excited, but like the, you know, 20 year old me, I'm thinking, I mean, I don't want to see him in a wheelchair. Does he still you know, have it? Does he still have it? How I mean, much? he. I mean, you know, he did stuff with AJ Styles, but it was like cut. You know, that was they, cut. Cut, they cut a lot of. That it. was a lot of somatic. It was. A, it seemed yeah. like more like a short film. Mm -hmm. And so, like this match he did with Roman Reigns was good, but like the match with Goldberg wasn't. I won't say it was the best. <laughs> so that's why. So if he came back, it'd be great. But I automatically go back to Goldberg's match. That poor dude got dropped on his head. I keep going back to Undertaker <laughs> versus Goldberg, and I'm like, well, that could happen again. That's the one where we were all kind of joking and like, yeah. Do the Saudi Arabians really want to see two old men kill one another? Yeah. Is that really? I mean, he wants? dropped, you know, he dropped him on his head. He almost he died. Take, he got well, but on if head. you look at the Undertaker's face when he pins Goldberg, because you can tell that wasn't the finish. He was you know? not happy. He, he wasn't happy. He looked at the ref and just shook his head. They were supposed but, to go for an extra but because, like five minutes. Yeah, they were. And yeah. if you know, and wasn't that the main event? Yeah. And, but if you look from, I mean, he had good matches with Bray Wyatt. And when he and Kane fought the Wyatt family at Survivor Series, I liked those matches. But 
after the Roman Reigns match, it seemed like every match is like five or ten, not even five minutes. Yeah. So you got to take into consideration the matches are getting shorter. Like his match with John Cena was uh, not not that many minutes. Like two minutes. John Cena two took minutes. most of the did most of the stuff. Yeah. I mean, and I like the Undertaker, but I keep going back to the Goldberg match. Well, you see, know, that's what I'm saying is like if that's the best he could do, and that was a couple of years ago already. Yeah. Then the only thing I can think of on a pie chart of why does he come back? It's all one color, and it says he yeah, just wants nostalgia. to. It, yeah, because I mean, like old Undertaker, like big evil Undertaker, could do stuff today. I mean, but like to today's Undertaker couldn't go. Like, I'm not to sound bad. I love the Undertaker, but I don't think he could go 20, 20 25 minutes, not even 15, you know, no. like a main eventer, you know? No. no. Now, if you gave him three months, maybe he's been working out. I don't know. But based on what I've seen of him, you give him three months to work out, he might be able to give you. Ten. 10. Ten. I mean, and you know, it might be a great 10 minutes. You but get a you good 10 minutes, him. but like after five to seven, yeah. he's exhausted. He's exhausted. Injured. But you also got to go. How's he going to feel the day after? How's he right. going to feel a few hours after? Yeah. Well, once, that, the, yeah. once the medication wears off or whatever it is. Well, I mean, and you yeah. can even go back to the Brock Lesnar match at WrestleMania oh. 30. I mean, you can. Well, Undertaker got a concussion. I was, I so yeah, he I was going to say he got a concussion. Well, he got thrown on his head so many times, but you can tell about. Halfway into the match, you can tell he was just his. You see his fists; they were just like this. You know, he was he was trying to stabilize himself, and that like really broke my heart a little bit. You know, and that was wanted, a long time ago already. Yeah, and I wanted yeah. Undertaker to win, you know, but obviously that didn't happen. And then he had right. to get carried out by. Well, you saw at the 2011 match with him and Triple H, he had to be literally driven out of the arena. So that and that's what I'm. Yeah, I, I don't know if he's taking into account, like if he thinks that that's adding to the fans experience, I feel like he's ignoring the fans experience to focus on him having his last hurrah. I think he gives it all for the fans. He gives it all, but then, but then he doesn't point. realize that it can break you too. It breaks you and they see and less of the character yeah. and more of the, the human man because the undertaker that's actually injured. The undertaker is supposed yeah. to be like in, in, Immortal. on paper or yeah. in you know on tv he's like this mythical god you know yeah. but there's when you no see him like, there's him. no stopping the undertaker you see he always he does the michael myers sit up you know right. he gets up you know well when undertaker doesn't get up you know he didn't get up during brock lesnar's match he took him a minute you know so it's showing that he's it was breaking you know he was breaking down i have a question for you All right. okay do you guys uh, think it was a wasted opportunity when the undertaker beat bray wyatt or should he have handed the phenom off to bray wyatt the new phenom hmm. i mean that that might have been a missed opportunity i get that he was like sort of redeeming himself from the last year i get that you know and i did like the match but i mean yeah that would have been great i mean that would have been really cool as much as you'd love to see it and i'm a wrestling fanatic i've been watching since i was a baby i was born on it i I've told them I had videotapes from my parents and my grandparents from before in like the early 70s and 80s. So I've been watching for a while. The nostalgia of the Phenom, the dead man, the American badass, all that can level a person and it can bring them up. But The Undertaker and Bray Wyatt both said it perfectly, I think. Mm -hmm. Ray Wyatt wasn't trying to be the Undertaker. He wasn't trying to be a version of the Undertaker. He was trying to be the best version of himself that was a dark character like the Undertaker was. Yeah. But he wanted to cement his own legacy and his own darkness and his own thoughts through his characters. And I believe he did. He did do that. And yeah. it, every single one took a, another, ster uh, another step up. We started with Husky Harris, and then we went to the Bray Wyatt, uh, the, the Wyatt family. The call family, Bray Wyatt, and then we went. To the fiend the next one and then the next one and then it keeps yeah. going mm -hmm. and you know even after sadly like i said even though now he's gone it sucks um mm -hmm. they're still yeah you know, the fireflies are still out people are still talking about him. people still praise him even the undertaker said he's not going to tell anybody except for maybe like bray's family what he told bray that one time yeah when he was with when him he, in the ring the last time. Him, yeah, yeah, and he threw him to Bray Wyatt. Yeah. But I but heard there's going to be a documentary. and A lot of people are saying you know? that he basically told him that, hey, 
his the Undertaker's legacy is going to live on in in you. And now that he's gone, the question is what happens with the legacy. And a lot of people are saying and speculating that his brother's going to take over, which would be oh. interesting. Mm-hmm. Could maybe, especially because uh-huh. you know that whole family was wild. Yeah, you've had so many generations. You've had so many different gimmicks and characters. You've had you know a tax man. You've got the bully. You've got Howdy. You've got Bray. You've got the Fiend. Mm-hmm. You've got Sister Bar Abigail. City Club. Was yeah. Sister Abigail even a real person? We don't know. Yeah, I love all that. Um, Reese, yeah. I don't know if you saw it. My um, black and red stripe gear mm-hmm. was absolutely like an homage to the fiend. I remember um, seeing that. I thought that was really great. And that was honestly why our podcast started in the first place was that he had come out as the fiend. We'd never seen anything like that in wrestling. Like I've been watching it since the early eighties. Never have I seen anything like the fiend in wrestling. So mm-hmm. exciting. And then to have Vince put him in the thing with, with, uh, uh, Seth oh, smashes yeah. his head with his own hammer, puts him out. We're like, "What in the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. Um, what a crushing! I can't even believe that happened. I cried Me when too. I heard about Bray passing. Um, Me too. We all did. We all did. I, mean, I know they're people. they're going to be doing a documentary on on Bray Wyatt, and I heard the Undertaker's narrating it. See. That would be really cool. Yeah. Um, I think when I think of him and I think of the fiend, and I and I agree with what you said. There was no way of making him like the new Undertaker, nor should he. But that would be ridiculous. But it was almost more like you can't have more than one supernatural like yeah right that guy. Mm-hmm. And and it seemed very apparent to all of us like Bray's absolutely gonna be that guy. Right. And and to me, this is a great opportunity to look at like what happens. We didn't know he was going to pass, right? So, but you also, so you can never, yeah, you never know when somebody's going to go. So it's like sometimes mm-hmm. when you don't strike opportunity, here we are, left to wonder what if. Yeah, you know? I know. So. It's, I'm still shocked by it, even though it's been, you know, been a couple months. It's still shocking. It's really, really heartbreaking to me. It is. He was, he was, because like I brought up Raven. Mm-hmm there's kind of always been like one or two people around the fringes who are like really creative, really trying to push certain boundaries. You're not really allowed to be the main guy when you're doing that, but there's always space for that. And Raven was one and there's absolutely no question. I mean, yeah, but Bray was. Bray was like one of a kind almost, you know, Bray's Bray. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The crazy Bray's thing too is like, these people sit down and they talk to them. like Undertaker and Bray Wyatt sat down and talked about their WrestleMania match. Mm-hmm. Undertaker and Brock Lesnar sat down and talked about their match. Then you like they've even talked about it. John Cena and Bray Wyatt sat down and talked about their match. John Cena said that was the first and I think the only match that he's ever written front to back. And the whole time he was sending Bray and I think Cole. Yeah. Michael Cole and I think Vince McMahon, those three people, they were all in a chat and he was just sending drafts to them. And like, hey, if there's anything you want to revive or you want to revise or you want to look over or you want to change, let me know. And the whole time, Bray Wyatt was like, you just send me the end. Send me the end. Send me the end. You send me the whole thing at the end. And at the end, Bray Wyatt was like, I like it. I love it. There's nothing you need to change. We're going to add a few more things here and there. But everything you have, he loved. He wanted it to stay in there. And it's mainly because... John Cena literally sat down and said, okay, what all do I have from the past that we can bring forward? What do you have from me? What do you have from Bray? What do you have from back in the day? Like the fist, the NWO stuff. Yeah. Most of that stuff they had packed away in, you know, the, uh, the old, They're like the, the archives, the archives. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you know, they've had, they have so much stuff that like, it's insane. That, that match, they said it would have costed them so much money to remake all that stuff if they wouldn't have saved it. Yeah. It was like a, I think he said it was over $10 million for half the stuff mm-hmm. just for that one match. And that match was only like 30 to yeah, 35 minutes. Because it was like a story. And it that's because yeah. it was a story of both their lives. Mm-hmm. 
Just and I see that I see that match, and I think of that as like a love letter to wrestling fans because it's so many But uh-huh. do you remember how many wrestling fans shit on that match? Oh yeah, yeah. Almost everyone hated it. it, it they, it, it's just, it's just this. It's like a horror movie. It's this. It's that. It's them playing to your fantasies and their own. You just gotta look into yeah. it deeper. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. showing you the lore of John Cena and the lure or the newer, you know, version of the Face of Fear. He said. Yeah. They're showing you how John Cena used to be and how they're building up Bray Wyatt now. It just felt like, as a musician, it felt very much like everybody going to the metal show and getting pissed when anybody plays anything other than a chug riff. Mm -hmm. You want every single person up there to just go jump, jump, jump the whole time? That's what you want? Right. Okay, great. When we get somebody who comes along who's creative enough to take wrestling and do this, and it's still wrestling, but man, what a fun new perspective. Like, It's just... I don't know. Galileo got in trouble for gravity, so it's like true. anything true. new. Gets you. It's very true. Yeah, I just I saw that, and you know what else really got me was when Randy had his thing with uh, Bray. Yeah, and then they fight out the cabin, mm-hmm. and then they had the WrestleMania match with the maggots on the ring. It like that wasn't the best thing in the world, but mm-hmm. I like the I like the before the fiend one where it was Luke Harper or Brody Lee, Eric. Randy and Bray, just yeah. the three. Mm. And it's when, you know, when he had the WWE title before the match, how he burnt down the whole Sister Abigail house and all that. I like the storytelling of it. And then the match just, it was okay. Yeah. Like, see, if they had all that build up and then finish it off the way they finished that Cena angle. Right. Not the exact same, but something similar. It would have made way more sense. the same. Yep. 100%. It it came off as anticlimactic because it was all cinematic, cinematic, cinematic. Mm -hmm. Oh, now it's just a match with some maggots on the canvas. Like what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you got to be careful how much you deliver to. It's like you got to bear in mind what can our payoff actually be, and we can't shoot any higher than our payoff, or it's going to be an anticlimax. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. And it was, unfortunately. Yep. Now all we have to do is look back at the good times of Bray Wyatt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, hope that wrestling, you know, changes. And creative ways, the way he thought a little bit, because mm. while he was out of the box, he had a lot of great ideas, and a lot of his segments and matches were enjoyable. It wasn't just because he could wrestle or because he had what it took. It's because he knew how to work with a person, he knew how to communicate, and he knew what exactly he had to do to keep, you know, his part going. Mm-hmm. And really. So in wrestling, we have people who are never going to cut a good promo. We could think of a bunch of them right now. They've been on TV for 20 years. They're never going to cut a good promo. It's fine. Right. Then you got people who are really good talkers. But Bray was one of the rare ones. Do you know what it means when we talk about uh, performers being fearless? Mm-hmm. Like he wasn't worried about looking good or sounding perfect or being handsome. Or he was one of those people as a director you want Bray Wyatt. He's going to give you everything and he's going to be vulnerable and he's going to do things. Most people are afraid of having those traits seen. He's going to focus on that. Like that's the most giving thing an artist can do is dig into the vulnerability that human beings don't want to ever reveal, but they're, but they're universal human traits. And for him to put an interesting spin on it and make it the center of attention in such a macho you know what I mean? Like the media itself, to right. be that artistic, it's just revolutionary. Right. Uh, yeah. 100%. I just remember. I just remembered something. Check this out. I don't really do wrestling memorabilia, but this is really the only big expensive thing I've got. Oh, wow. wow, that's that's awesome. Super cool. Yeah, it's the old. Uh, crazy. I love that. Mm-hmm. Now it's not the one that they were charging like six grand for, whatever oh. ridiculous thing it was. But yeah, um, that's crazy. That's awesome. But that yeah. is super cool. I found out uh, a friend had a, bu- a bunch of belts he's get rid of, and I was like, "If you've got that Bray Wyatt thing, I will." Hundred percent. That's yeah. really cool. Here we are, man. Bray was such a a great person and a great like you know superstar. I I as you said, and I've said it in a different way, but I like I'm gonna say it clear as a clearer way he was a great performer i loved watching him in the ring but i wish he wouldn't have passed and he would have did his thing but also i wanted to see what he did in the future 
mm-hmm. not just as a performer, but like you said, as a writer or a producer. How could right. you make other people's storytelling and product better with your creative mind? Because like I said, he thought more way out of the box. He was he was under the, the impression of like Jericho, Patterson, uh, Dusty Rhodes, those type of people. They all thought a little bit outside the box and you know, further into the future. What what could we do with this? How can we make this go further and better? Like he was one of those people like Daniel, for instance, Daniel Bryan, that whole lead up to the, the strap match. He said he only had to put in one idea. The rest was all Bray Wyatt and the producers. That's mm-hmm. wild. Or per se, like he said, like like I said, John Cena sent him a whole thing. He goes, yeah, I love the whole thing. But we're going to add this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. Done. There was or, the thing with the Miz. The Miz, yep, per se. Like he all the Firefly on House mm-hmm. Friends invaded the house. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I remember, I don't know, one of the other things about wrestling, and I, I don't want this to sound sour again, but Wrestling has created its own entire at the <laughs> cliche, its own universe. Mm-hmm. We have all of our own podcasts. We have our own right. wrestling movies. We have our wrestling celebrities. We have our, right. it's it's a whole other thing. I wish part of it wasn't the two generations past retired wrestlers who start podcasts right. and absolutely shit on every new thing that wouldn't have worked thirty or forty years ago. Mm-hmm. and doing it on five or six different platforms throughout the day, every single day on an endless loop on YouTube, like CNN. And like, why do I need to hear Cornette and Bischoff? Uh, thank you. And, and J- what's his face? Uh, old man. Uh, I want to call him Jed. I can't remember his name. Uh, Harry dude. Oh, uh, it, did he have the big mustache or no? People power. Uh, Doug. Oh, 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 people Laura power. Nidus. John Laurinaitis. Sorry, uh, Dutch Mantel. Um, Dutch Mantel. Oh, oh, I know you're talking about. What yeah. was the thing when they're the anti the Americans? Oh, is that the, the We the People? Nation. We the People. That's what it was. Oh, well, yeah, he was Zeb Coulter. Yeah, yeah, but like, I can remember all of them talking shit about how weird the Funhouse stuff was when it was starting to happen. Yeah, yep. What the fuck is this supposed to be? This would never. And so then, what does that do? a vast majority of like hardcore wrestling fans of a certain generation and demographic listen to those shows, which means they immediately don't give it the time of day, which means somebody bright and refreshing like a Bray Wyatt immediately gets turned down by these talking heads who get a lot of the fans to not take it seriously either. And now he's gone and everybody's like, Oh my God, what a wasted opportunity. We had him and you basically wasted it. Biggest, I guess that's what the biggest one I've noticed other than two of the well three of the, three of the two that you mentioned are Rus- or well my biggest one is Russo Vince Russo mm-hmm. and then Cornette and Bischoff yeah mm-hmm. those three are the men who came up with the most outrageous yeah the random <laughs> wild crazy bullshit that they could come up with and it worked yeah. and now they just bash everything yeah. that's basically the same that they would have thought yeah. of 30 years ago right. but now there's new people thinking of it oh it's not gonna work you could have said the same thing about the elimination chamber you could have said the same thing about the brawl for all you know i mean you could have said you i mean can say the same people do say and you know why vince russo came up with that he hated bradshaw that's why he came up with it you want to see him get his mouth shut and watch him get punched out yeah. And uh, Dan, Dan Severn, he he entered it and he was like, this is stupid. Yep. So he drew mm-hmm. himself out of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then poor Steve Williams, got yeah. old JR, he's been his whole career oh, based on oh, Steve Williams. <sighs> yeah. My so man, Dr. Death, Dr. Death got punched. <laughs> yeah. And never seen again. Yeah. And then they wanted to make, because they wanted him to fight Steve Austin and Bart Gunn was the one who actually won, I believe. Yep. So they had him fight Butterbean. <laughs> Yeah, they're like, yeah, you were never supposed to win this, pal. You're just gonna go get yeah. And and Bart said it destroyed. on Dark Side of the Ring. He said I wasn't supposed to win, but they wanted me to punch, so I punched. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. supposed to win, but I was told that. But it was, they wanted Doctor Death was, uh, to have a title run against Austin. You know. Well, Jr. would have loved that, but I don't think the fans were ever that invested in Steve Williams no. even back in the day in NWA. He was never world title material. That wasn't gonna work. Mm-hmm. Curious That's on how that would work with JR as well. JR yeah, was 
Gus was in Hagar. He was like, yeah. He was. Well, that's what have been the Jr. Would have done it, and he would have made himself the mouthpiece, and it would have been okay. Yeah, but, but he's he's gonna have to trash talk one and work with the other, even though he's really close friends with both. And like he enjoyed Austin at the time, so like, how well would that have actually worked? Uh, act that works pretty well, actually. Because think about like when Don Callis was with Kenny Omega for longest, and yeah. then he went okay. against him. Yeah, that mm-hmm. kind of goes back to the whole like friends make good enemies That's in true. wrestling because you know you can true. like really go at each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. So, I think I, I what I would love to see is more of Reese's vibe. You're lovely, but you're not quite as positive as Reese. <laughs> Um, it's fair. I just think if there was more of that energy and less of this older guy, grump, grump, back in my day energy, everything would just keep progressing and evolving and there wouldn't be any hindrance and there wouldn't be any obstacles. And it would be its best at all times because it's always taking in this new stuff to make it even better. Yeah. But instead, it's a constant fight against the old guard. Who just mm-hmm. want it to be the same, and that's that's the human condition. That's what I've learned in my forty-eight years on Earth, wrestling or otherwise. The mm-hmm. older you get, the more you want it the way it used to be, and unfortunately, the older you get, the more power you have, mm-hmm. which means now you're going to hold these younger generations down. And that's one of the things I want to do as an older person: be like, "Yo, hold these doors open. We had our time. Right? Get in here. Do your new thing. Like, let's see the evolution of this thing. You know, mm-hmm. That's what I, that's what I want to see." Yes. Um, and Bray Wyatt was a massive, could have been the entire platform for that. And, you know, we didn't get it. Interesting. 100%. I agree. Yes. Um, I believe we have at least enough time for each of us to ask one more question if we have them. And then we'll uh, get ready to head out. Yeah. Do you have another one? Are you ready? Yes. If you yeah. want to go first, you can. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, I ask this question a lot. And I, I feel like we've asked it in a way, but I want to see if you know the answer has changed now from the beginning to now, or if you could add on to it. But uh, what's one piece of advice? What's well? What's the one biggest piece of advice that you would give to a newer a newcomer coming into the industry, whether like I said, male, female, transgender, non-transgender? What's one of the biggest piece of advice you could give to a, a newer wrestler? Um, um, the same, the same advice that I got from some people who I'm going to hold near and dear way past wrestling, Okay. which was, you seem to have a clear idea of who you are as a person, right? Don't lose that. Oh. They, I had people tell me specifically with your politics, with your identity, sexuality, gender, all, all this stuff, there's a little area in wrestling for you, but it's tiny. And it's osmosis. The more you're anywhere, the more you become where you are. And I had a couple people say, like, this may not be good for you. And if you start to feel like you're changing, don't. And that was part of my determining factor at the end as well, was realizing what I was starting to like be okay with or what I was being pulled towards. And my message to everybody will always be, you have to come first. You are bigger than wrestling. Your life is bigger than your involvement in wrestling. 100%. Mm-hmm. Prioritize you. Yes. Yeah. That's great. And uh, my question, I always, I usually ask this for wrestlers. Uh, if you could go back and talk to a younger version of Davis and Sarai, uh, what would you say? That would be a fucking trip because I'm talking <laughs> about like, yo. Um, I would say try not to worry so much about the stuff you're worried about. Do it all faster. Do it all sooner. Okay. Don't wait. Um, that's, that's... Which is kind of a universal thing I hear a lot of people say as well. It's really interesting being like middle aged. <laughs> Starting to have all this middle aged wisdom. Like, yeah, don't wait. Things are scary, but it turns out when you look back at them, they weren't that scary. Mm-hmm. What should be scarier is going to bed and going, fuck, did I miss those opportunities? Did I waste chances? Did I not reach for the thing? Um, Make sure you That's do. Shoot your shot. 100%. Thank you very much for joining us and coming on. It was great talking to you. Absolutely. I had a great yeah. time. 
we'll definitely have to bring you on again. Yeah, for part two. For a part two, have a little more stories. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. Ask about, you know, any possible legends you've worked with or talked to or got to, to you know, talk with. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like that. And, and I, want, I want to say it again. Like, I'm pretty recently out, and so I, I don't like that I might sound salty, but it's just like my experience very recently is still percolating. I completely um, understand. Yes. I mean, no, we completely understand. Yeah. But if, you know, I come back another time, it could just be more fun and, you know, more stories. I, I mean, it, we had a great time. I, had, I was going to say, I had a, for the first one back in, you know, two and a half, three weeks almost, I had a blast. I, Good. It seems a little, you know, tiring and boring, not going to lie, but it's nothing against you or us. Um, we're usually with more people, mm -hmm. and there's surprisingly usually loud noise <laughs> going there's on usually, above there, us. There's, there's a third floor above us. We have a third floor above us, and they're usually dancing, doing like a exercise with music and like craziness. Mm. So like we usually hear a lot of music, and we're usually like pumped up because of that. So it's just yeah. so calm and relaxed. Yeah. But like, I've I was so focused and into it and enjoying it. Mm -hmm. I I had so much fun. I I haven't smiled in a while um mainly because i was sick <laughs> but, but like coming back and just talking and mm -hmm. you know hearing stuff and you know getting to talk wrestling more um i think helped and you know it shows us more about us and it, you know brings out more happiness in certain things like yeah talking about something you love and you enjoy and you're talking with people yet their you know their story their side and, you know some wise info and you know knowledge from them about Oh, stuff you love and you're learning and anything's possible you know no matter who you talk to the advice is usually always different the stories are different you know the journey's different the paths are different you know i didn't hear i don't think I, we didn't really get into it but i didn't hear one story you know i had to sleep in my car or you know i drove this place and i only got 25 bucks even though i was oh those are all there i just don't like, that's the thing. there's a lot of, lots of those. Like, right. That's what I'm saying. You're one of those people that didn't go straight to the negative or the the, the, the down low real yeah. quick. You, you stayed as positive as you could. Mm -hmm. You told as much stories as you could. You gave as much info. You gave us this. You gave us that. And yeah, we asked those questions to, you know, basically get those answers. But like, we didn't, you know, serve them to you right away. You, we didn't, you know, hey, this is what we didn't hand it to you. Like, this is what's going to be said, what's happening. You know, we came randomly prepared with certain things like next time we'll probably have other random more new questions you never know anything we could also ask you the same things again like i could ask you the same question but you could have a different piece of advice anything's you never know probably yeah. too. I, learned, I learned so much new stuff every week from somebody whether it's a piece of advice or it's a, if it's a saying or anything like one week i randomly took a quote from one of the wrestlers because it was so good. Yours, I'm not gonna lie, I took a few things from yours as well. Mm -hmm. You know, very quotable. 100. percent Be yourself. You know, yeah. push, put yourself first. Like you said, you know, you got to do this. You, you got to think outside the box. You got to do this. You got to do that. You know, keep keep mo focused on your mental health. You know, psychology. Mm -hmm. Just that. The other. You know. There's. I can't think of it all right now because <laughs> I'm you know, just rambling it off, but. I definitely took a lot. I smiled. I, I enjoyed it. I laughed a little bit. I. This is one of my, uh, mm -hmm. one of my new top ones. I'd say. Yes. Good. Good. I wanted to say before I go, in full sincerity, um, outside of wrestling, and I said it before the show. I'm gonna say it again. This is Reese and I. As far as I know, I don't remember <laughs> us meeting in person. Have we met in person? I'm forgetting it. Uh, no, we haven't met in person. I didn't think so. Reese has been the, and I'm not saying one of the, I'm saying the most optimistic, persistent, I'm not saying consistently, persistently positive voice in my internet head on a daily basis for a very, very, very long time. 100%. Thank you. Not just and for you. I mean, you, you know, not only in wrestling, but outside, you're an awesome individual. I mean, I, and I, I am honored to call you a friend. Yeah. Not just we, you, and it's not just wrestling. Like you said, he's done it for Monroe. He does it for Brain Jerk, which is 
I mean, I our uh, little company where and I mean, and, you know, and you anywhere. don't. I don't per se. I don't do it like to say, oh, he's real positive. I just, I mean, I like to support people around me, and not only people people who I don't know. I try to be supportive of them too. Oh, it doesn't come off like you're trying. To, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't come off like an act. It doesn't come off like try hard. It doesn't. Not, yeah, it doesn't come I mean, off as trying at all. It's just it happens. I mean, it's just I. Y- you know, I mean, and just people have said, you know, I mean, it just takes so, as I said before, so it just takes so much energy to be hateful and negative. And mm-hmm. like I told my sister, I said, one of the worst words in the English language is not the F word. It's hate. Mm-hmm. It's one of the strongest words. Mm-hmm. Too. It's one of the strongest words, too. Yeah. So I would rather, you know, t- I try to turn negatives into positives and I try to look at the glass half full. And I, you know, I. I don't know if that helps people or not, but I try to do it. Well, I'm letting you know that personally it has helped me. Thank you. That means so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Reese is a positive robot. No. <laughs> oh, he's a bot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a bot. I know. <laughs> he's I remember a positive you said that. robot. <laughs> so, yeah, he's so positive. I refuse to believe it was even. That's how cynical it's become out here. Be a real person. Yeah, he's too yeah. nice. <laughs> and then you meet him, and it's like. And it's like, Damn oh, it. it's, it's real. He's That's, real. Yeah. He's just that freaking nice. I mean, and I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I try. I mean, I try. I don't know. But yeah. you, you your best. You're doing it. It's good. It's great. Yeah. You're a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. This is really fun. And Absolutely. don't hesitate. Yeah, hit me up. We'll do it again. Awesome. Thank you Sounds very much. like a fantastic idea. We shall for sure do that. With that being said, once again, I'm Brother Paul. That's Reese. This is our host, Miss Davison. And uh, with that being said, join us next week with Setu Jin. Um, we'll be talking IWR and you know just wrestling in general once again with him. But before we go, once again, we would like to thank all of our sponsors for the love and support on each and every episode constantly, which is the Mint Cannabis Smoker Society, Cilantro, 8 Mile Vodka, Amaya's Fresh Mexican Girl, Lane's Pizzeria, Dudes Talking Wrestling, Insane Wrestling Revolution, Pro Wrestling Edge, the Little Brown Drug, Raving Sports Cards and Collectibles, and Nerdy Designs. Thank you all for your love and support on each and every episode, Thank every you. single week. And once again, join us next week. Thank you all. Sat- Have a Have great, a great night. night. Satu Jin, you owe me $50, you mother. Brought to you by Brain Jerk. Fuck yeah.